Uh, we're going to go ahead and go to 1 Samuel, the sixth chapter. Are we already there? Okay, great, great. We'll uh, read a couple of verses and then we'll go back and see if we can expound upon them, all right? Okay, it says right here, uh, 1 Samuel 6, it says, And the ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith we shall send it to his place. Verse 3, And they said, If ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They answered, Five golden emeralds, five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of your mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto the God of Israel. Peradventure he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Let's stop right there go back to verse 1. Now, we know from uh, last Sunday we had dealt with this issue of the Philistines that captured the Ark of the Covenant or the Ark of God. Uh, it was brought into the Temple of Dagon, and God took care of Dagon. Da- uh, Dagon fell over the first night. They set him back up, and then he fell over the second night, but God cut off his head and, and his hands. And so from there, they began to move the Ark of God from place to place in the area, in the Philistine area, this place, this white area right here that's called Philistia. Uh, there are five city-states here, and they just moved the Ark from place to place, and everywhere they moved the Ark, God would send them destruction. One of the ailments that he gave them was what we believe was probably hemorrhoids, or a bad case of something in their hinder parts, according to the, what we read about uh, last, uh, last Sunday. So uh, we see here in uh, verse 1, it says, The ark of the Lord was in the country of the Philistines seven months. Now, my first question, I have a question for the the Philistines, but I also have a question for the children of, of God, because we see that there is no text or information that says that the children of God tried to rescue the ark from the time that the Philistines took it. It's like once the Philistines took it, they just gave up because the Philistines had it for seven months and there's no record of any attempt of the children of God trying to regain one of the most precious items that God had bestowed upon them. It was precious enough for them to take it into battle in in chapter four. But then when the Philistines took it, they were like, "Eh, okay. And we'll learn uh, later on Uh, probably in 1 Samuel 7, that the children of Israel began to worship other gods. And so the God of the Bible became less and less important to them. And Samuel, for which this book is named, had to set them straight and say, hey, look, you need to put away these idol gods and worship the true and living God. All right, but it's a shame that seven months had gone by and they didn't make any attempt to stand up and and get the ark. According to what we know, there's no evidence that they tried that. And how that applies today is, is I think about when uh, in 2020, when COVID hit and the government literally tried to take away our rights to gather in in the sanctuary and says, you need to stay home. It was okay for the CBD, the marijuana dispensaries and and, and, uh, the goody goody liquor store to stay open. It was okay for them to stay, stay open, but they tried to shut the church down. And it's a shame that so many church people laid down and allowed the government to do that. Okay? Some are still laying down. Unfortunately, many of the churches never recovered and they're closed. All right? And and so we should not have the same apathy that these people had. The, The children of Israel made no attempt to rescue the ark. Now, on the flip side, if you look at the Philistines, the Philistines had this ark and it was causing them nothing but death and destruction. They had hemorrhoids. They had death and destruction, according to, uh, let's see here, uh, verse 9. It says, the Lord was against the city with a very great destruction. Um, In verse 11, it mentions, for there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. And so God God was just giving it to them. But it didn't dawn on them. They didn't have enough sense to say, hey, you know what? Maybe it's because of our sin that in the fact that we have this ark and we're not supposed to have this ark, 
this ark's causing all these problems for us. They would just send it from city to city, and they sat on it for seven months. And, and that's very unfortunate. And, and that's something else that we could apply to our lives today is that when you're going through a situation, um, it may be, a, 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 when I say a, a, a situation, I mean a negative situation. You're having problems in your marriage. You've got financial problems. You've got health problems. It may be, not in all cases, but it may be that God is judging you for some type of sin. And, and like I said, that's not in all cases because we could always turn to the book of Job and God admitted himself that Job was a complete man, that he did nothing wrong, but God did put him to a trial. God did put him through a test. But realistically, the majority of people uh, who have problems is because they made bad decisions, not because they're living a, a Job lifestyle. All right? And here in this case, it's, it's, it's sad that the Philistines, instead of acting immediately, really the first night when they put the Ark of the Covenant in the Temple of Dagon and it fell over, that should have told them right there, we need to get rid of this ark. Right now. They sat on it for seven months and they went through trials and, and, and destruction, according to the scripture. They went through destruction because they didn't have enough sense to return the ark. And a lot of people do that. Instead of submitting to a holy and righteous God, they'd rather just uh, wallow in their sin and God will just constantly judge them. All right? And it, and it shouldn't be that way. All right? So that was a lot from verse 1. Let's move on. Do we have any questions, comments? Amen. 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 Because I, how, 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 how is somebody going to threaten you with heaven, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, I don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir? The way it looks around this country and the world, I wouldn't be surprised if the Lord would come, uh, call us all home soon. Yes, sir. And I know what Pastor Watt has been saying for the past four years. Mm -hmm. That Jesus may come, mm -hmm. and I wish he would for it. Mm -hmm. we, correct. Mm -hmm. We wish we would hurry up and mm -hmm. come. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Anyone else? Okay, let's go to verse 2. It says in verse 2, And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners. Now, this is their priests and their diviners, like witch doctors and sorcerers and stuff like that. This is their people. They're not calling upon God's priests, all right? They're calling upon their so-called uh, wise men and, and witch doctors or what have you to get an answer to what to do with the Ark of the Lord. And it's interesting here, you don't have to turn there, but in Isaiah 2.6, Isaiah 2.6 actually tells us that the Philistines, they were not known for Goliath or just being a great army. They were actually known for their soothsayers, okay, according to Isaiah 2.6. Uh, and so uh, there was a lot of wizardry and warlocks and witches uh, involved in the Philistine culture that um, many people may not be aware of. But anyway, so they went to the, the, the priest and the diviner saying, What shall we do to the ark of the Lord? Tell us wherewith shall we send it to his place. And verse 3 it says, And they said, If ye send away the ark of the God of Israel, send it not empty, but in any wise return him a trespass offering, then ye shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What shall be the trespass offering which you we shall re return to him. Then answered five golden emrods and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and on your lord. So what are they saying right here? In verse number three, the, the, the diviners and the, and the Philistine priests are saying, you need to give a trespass offering back to God. Now, the trespass offering, the concept of the trespass offering, actually came from the children of Israel, uh, actually came from God. But it was designated in uh, the book of uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy that if someone were to sin against the Lord, they were to bring an offering to the priest, and the priest would intercede on, on their behalf. Of course, now, since we're under the new covenant, uh, we can go directly to the priest of priests, king of kings, lord of lords, and we can directly ask the Lord to forgive us according to 1 John 1, 9. Yes, sir? It's interesting. They don't have it. They, they have no power at all or, or no effectiveness at all. And that's a very good point. We're actually going to read here a little later here about how the God of the Bible is so much more greater than the gods that they were serving, but yet and still they wanted to serve the weaker gods or the lesser gods. You would, you would, you would think so, but uh, they didn't do that. Yes, sir? Remember who their God is? The devil, right? Yes, He's yes. Trying to derive here. 
Yes. They don't realize they should, but they don't realize that, hey, these guys are fake. They don't have any power. Right, that's true. And the New Testament does talk about how the devil has blinded the eyes of, of, of this world. That's, that's, that's very true. Yes, absolutely. All right. Um, so they're going to give this trespass offering. Uh, they probably got this concept from Leviticus 5, 6, where God talks about the t- trespass offering and when you sin, how you're supposed to give an offering back to the Lord. And so, but this thing is, they are admitting at this point that they have sinned against the God of Israel, and now they want to appease the God of Israel with an offering. So they're not re- repenting and getting right with God. They're just saying, okay, God, we're going to do this till you stop beating us up and beating up our gods. All right. But, but they still, their hearts are still hardened to the point where they're not willing to submit to the God of the Bible. All right. So what they're going to do, according to verse four, this is very odd. They're going to make images of the things that are destroying them. They're going to make images of the hemorrhoids, which is kind of odd. I, I don't even want to know what that looks like. <laughs> And then it says, five golden mice according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for one plague was on you all and on your lords. Wherefore, ye shall make images of your emeralds and images of the mice that mar the land, and ye shall give glory unto God of Israel. That's a good thing. Her adventure, he will lighten his hand off of you and from off your gods. Well, Brother Bigno was just speaking. They're, they're, they went to the priest, and the priest is saying, hey, if you do this, then maybe the God of Israel will stop beating up your gods. Yeah. Is, isn't that crazy? But that's in here. It says, you know, to, to lighten the load off of your gods and from off your land. Now you say here in verse 4 and 5, it mentions mice. And you say, well, we don't recall there being any mentioning of mice in the, in the previous chapter. But if you go back and look at verse 11 of uh, 1 Samuel 5, 11, the previous chapter. Uh, make note of this. It says, So they sent and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it go again to his own place, that it slay us not and our people. And it says, For there was a deadly destruction throughout all the city. The hand of, of God was very heavy there. So during the time it's talking about this deadly destruction, that was a very broad term. It could also have been that that was a part of where the mice came from because it said that the mice was marring the land and was destroying the land. So not only did they have to make images of the emeralds, they had to make images of the mice. Yes, sir? They were golden mice. Right. <laughs> golden mice. And golden emeralds. <laughs> uh, that's the part I can't deal with. Very odd request that the priests have made right here. Golden mice. I can deal with the golden mice more so than the golden emeralds, but we'll, but we'll, we'll move on. We'll move on uh, from there. And it says here in verse 6, it says, Wherefore then do ye harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts when he had wrought wonderfully among them? Did they not let the people go and they departed? Now, right here, it once again is showing you how these people who are not God's people they have knowledge of the God of the Bible because they even recall when the children of Israel were in Egypt and how Moses led them out. And then they even recall how Pharaoh hardened his heart. Every time Moses uh, would ask God to, to put a plague on him, and Pharaoh would say, okay, I'll let him go. Then he'd harden his heart, change his mind. Okay, I'll let him go. The plague of frogs, plague of, of lice, you know, and the different plagues until ultimately Pharaoh did let them go. But the Philistines, they're familiar with that story to the point where they even mention it here. It says, don't you harden your hearts. Don't be like those crazy people in Egypt, all right? Even though, you know, Pharaoh, when those plagues came, I believe all of that may have happened in less than seven months' time. I don't know, but the the Philistines have been sitting on this ark for seven months, and God has just been going to town on them. And so they said, hey, you need to get these out of here. So uh, any questions or comments about that before we move on to verse 7? Okay, verse 7. It says, now, therefore, this is the priest telling the rest of the Philistines what they need to do to get out of this situation. It says, now, therefore, make a new cart and take two milk kine on which there hath come no yoke and tie the kine to the cart and bring their calves home from them and take the ark of the Lord and lay it upon the cart and put the jewels of gold which ye returned from him for a trespass offering in a coffer by the side thereof and send it away that it may go. And see if it goeth up by the way uh, of his own coast to Beth Shemesh, then he hath done 
us this great evil. Talking about God has done it to him. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand, it's not God's hand that smote us. It was a chance that happened to us. Oh, it's just a coincidence that when we brought the Ark of the Covenant into our midst that we started having all these problems. So either God is doing this or it's just a coincidence. All right. So let's go back to verse number seven and see if we can uh, analyze this a little further. It says as a solution to getting rid of the ark, the uh, the priests tell the people, make a new cart. Now, of course, uh, they're obviously are not too familiar with how the ark of the covenant is to be handled. But God is winking at this. It says, now take two milk kind, milch kind, milk, milch. It's where the word milk comes from. Kind is just a, a King James uh, way or old, old Testament way of saying cow. Okay? A kind is, it means cow or cows. All right? So take two dairy cows is basically what they're saying. On which there hath no yoke, tie the kind to the, to, the, uh, to the cart, bring the calves home from them, and take the ark of the Lord, lay it on the cart, and put it on the trespass offering, the jewels of gold, and then put it in a coffer, by the side thereof, and send it away that it may go. And if, and, and then if the, the cart goes towards the children of Israel's land, which would be Beth Shemesh, then we know that God is in it. If it wanders off somewhere else, then we know God's not in it. So what's happening right here is that uh, the, the, it's a very peculiar offer because they're a, a way of getting rid of the ark because they're saying, take two dairy cows which aren't used to pulling anything because it says, which hath come no yoke. Mm. They just had some calves because it says, bring their calves home from them. Tie the kind to the ark and there's not going to be anybody leading the the cart. They're just going to tie these dairy cows to the cart, take the calves from them and then slap them and send them on their way. And if they go to... uh, If they go to the children of Israel's land, the part that's not white, then that means God is in it. But if they wander off somewhere else, then that means God's not in it. They're really putting God to the test right here. Now, when I grew up um, with my grandmother, five years old, we only had one cow. So it was a a milk cow. It was a dairy cow. So I'm not very familiar with cows because I didn't grow up around a lot of cows. But I'm thinking generally, if you're going to have an animal or a beast pull a cart, wouldn't you use an ox or a mule or a horse? Why would you use milk cows, dairy cows, which have no experience in pulling a cart? You know, you have to break an animal in to train them to pull a cart. You just can't take a a horse and hook them up. You got to break the horse, right? Does anybody grow up in the country? I, I need some validation here. Anybody grow up on a farm? Okay. Yes, sir. That, that cow is going to, the cow is going to have a tendency to be with the calf. And, and so they're really stacking the odds against God. They, first of all, they're getting two cows. Neither one knows how to pull a cart because it says they've known no yoke. Then they're going to tie them together. You got to train animals to pull together. Okay. Even if you got the right kind of ox or mule, you still got to train them to pull together. So that's against them. Then they're going to uh, bring the calves back from the mothers who, like what Brother Robbie says, they have a tendency to want to be with their calves and vice versa. So the, uh, they're really stacking the odds against God to, to make God ha- really have to show up and see if, if these untrained milk cows are actually going to take this cart without anybody leading it back into the, the land of, Isra- of the children of Israel. All right? Yes, sir. Amen. You're absolutely right, and, and hopefully that will come out here a little later on in this chapter. But no one was supposed to handle the Ark of the Covenant but a Levite or someone who was consecrated to handle the Ark of the Covenant. And you don't have to turn there right now, but in Second Samuel, the sixth chapter, there's an example of a man who was not authorized to touch the cart. When he touched the cart, the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, excuse me, God struck him dead. Yeah. All right? And you say, well, why did God strike... The, uh, and his name was uh, Uzzah, Uzzah. Why did God strike the child of God dead, but then he let the Philistines do what they, he does? Because we're going to talk about later that if you're a child of God, God chastises his own. And we'll learn later also that judgment must first begin at the house of God. If you have a child who's disobedient, 
if that child, even if that child is in the midst of a, a bunch of other disobedient children, you're going to have a tendency to deal with your child first before you deal with the other children. So God's going to deal with us first for our sin before he deals with the Philistines. But he was winking at, at the fact that the Philistines were handling the cart wrong and all the, the Ark of the Covenant wrong because God was actually using them to get the Ark back to where it's supposed to be. All right. Any questions there? Notice one other thing here in verse number eight. It says that the Philistines took the jewels of gold. It's talking about the golden emeralds and the, and the golden mice. They didn't put th that, those jewels in the Ark of, of the Covenant of God. Y'all notice they didn't do that. What did they do? They made a coffer and they put it in a coffer. A coffer, coffer is just an enclosed box. It's where we get the word coffin from, an enclosed box. And so instead of putting the jewels of gold in the ark, they had too much respect for the ark. They just said, we'll put it in a box and <laughs> put it in the cart next to the ark. Y'all see that? Okay, because they, they just didn't want to take a chance. All right? And, but it's interesting in verse 9 where they say, hey, if it returns to the land of Israel, then God's in it. If it doesn't, then it was just a coincidence. All right. Verse 10. And the men did so, and they took two milch kind and tied them to the cart and shut up their calves at home and they laid the ark of the of the Lord upon the cart and the coffer with the mice of gold and images of their emeralds and the kind took off to the, the cows they took off straightway to the way of Bethshemeth this is the border town of where they'll be back in in the area that the children of Israel control and they went along the highway lowing as they went move move okay but they, were, they went anyway, and they turned not aside to the right hand nor to the left. So they made a beeline back to the children of God. All right? So obviously God was in the middle of this, right? Because there were too many things that could have gone wrong. Um, and the lords of the Philistines went after them under the border of Bethshemesh. So there were some of the Philistines that went along. They watched the, the cows take the cart, and they followed along at a safe distance to see if it was actually going to go where it was supposed to go. Yes. Uh, well, that's, that's true. I don't recall where they tried to open it either. They just took the ark and stuck it in the Temple of Dagon. But, yeah, you're right. I, I don't recall anywhere in Scripture where they actually attempted to open the ark. But that's going to be a major problem for the children of Israel later on here in a moment. Amen. Um, verse 13, and they of Beth Jemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley, and they lifted up their eyes and saw the ark and rejoiced to see it. All right, now I just want to make a couple of points here. Number one, remember that the children of Israel didn't even attempt to go get the ark, or at least we don't have anything in Scripture that says they tried to rescue the ark. But when the ark came back, they were glad to see it. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And, and oftentimes we have to be careful as, as, as Christians. We let things um, get away from, from us. Um, like right now, there is no prayer in public schools, I guess, in most public schools, if not all. Oh, but, okay. Okay, okay. But and, and my point that I was going to make was that, that we've gone about our daily lives because we're used to prayer not being in public school. But if prayer were to return to public school, we'd be rejoicing just like these people are rejoicing about the ark, okay, even though they didn't, they didn't do anything to have the ark return. The, another point that I want to make here is, is that uh, in verse 13 is that God doesn't need our help. Did the Philistines bring the ark back? No. Did the children of Israel rescue the ark and bring it back? No. God brought the ark back himself. <clears throat> Aren't we glad that we serve a God who doesn't need our help? Amen. Oftentimes, men try to help God uh, when we knock on doors and we ask them about salvation. They say, oh, well, you know, I, you know, I got to be a good person. I, you know, if you want to get saved, you got to get baptized. You got to go to church. You got to do these things. No, God doesn't need our help in order for him to offer, give us salvation. All we have to do is receive it. All right. Okay, but too often man is prideful and he wants to help God out. And he says, okay, yeah, God can save me, but I got to do this good act. I got to do something. I got to help God out. No, God doesn't need our help. Now, God is blessed and is glorified when we are obedient to him and we do the things that he asks us to do, such as prayer and soul winning and, 
and reading our Bible and things of that nature, God receives, you know, God is, is happy when we do those things. But the reality is, is that God doesn't need our help because God doesn't need us. He chooses to have uh, a creature that was made in his image. All right. He, he, cho- he chose that. He didn't have to do that. And even back during the time of Noah, he could have just wiped out Noah and everybody else and started over. He could have started with, wiped out Adam and Eve and started over if he wanted to, but he didn't do that. All right? So God doesn't need our help. And this is proven right here in verse 13 because the ark was returned on its own with nobody's help, but it was just an act of God. Amen? And the cart came into, verse 14, and the cart came into the field of Joshua at Bethshemite and stood there, and there was a great stone, and they claved the wood of the cart and offered the kind a burnt offering unto the Lord. And the Levites took down the ark of the Lord and the coffer that was with it, wherein the jewels of gold were, and put them on the great stone. And the men of Bethshemite offered burnt offerings and sacrifices sacrifices the same day unto the Lord. So what happened right there? Well, when the ark was returned, they killed the cows, take the wood that the, ark, that the cart was made out of, and they build an altar, and they, they burn a, a sacrifice unto God. Amen? That's what basically happens right there. Verse 15 is very key. The, the children of Israel know how to handle the ark because who was it that took the ark down? The Levites. The Levites. The designated, consecrated people who were set aside to, to handle such matters, okay? So not any man just walked up to the ark and took it off. The Levites took the ark off. Okay, y'all see that? Yeah. Okay, and when the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, the, the, they were still watching from a distance. All of this stuff happened. They returned to Ekron, that's one of their cities, the same day. Verse 17, this gives the list of the five city-states of, of, of Philistia. And these are the Golden Emirates which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering unto the Lord. For Ashdod won, for Gaza won. You know, Gaza's still around today, right? You hear about the Gaza Strip and, and Israel and all the fighting that's going on over there. Same area, same area. Uh, for Ashkelon won, for Gath won, and for Ekron won. And the golden mice, according to the number of all the cities of the Philistines belonging to the five lords, both the fenced cities and the country villages, even unto the great stone of Abel, where uh, upon Whereon they set down the ark of the Lord, which the stone remaineth until this day in the field of Joshua the Bethlehemite. Okay, any questions there? Let's read a little further. And he smote, when it says he right there, that's talking about God. That's talking about the Lord smote, okay? And he smote the men of Bethlehemite, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord, even he smote of the people 50,000 and threescore and ten men. So 50,070 men, is that right? Yeah. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the, of the people with the great slaughter. And the men of Bethlehem said, who is able to stand this, before this holy Lord God? And who shall he go up from us? And they sent messengers into the inhabitants of uh, Kerjoth, uh, Jer- Arim, Arim, saying, the Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. Come ye down and fetch it up to you. So now they're calling upon some other men to come get the ark after they have been disobedient and they looked into the ark, but they actually made a, a mistake here in that last part. It says the Philistines have brought again the ark of the Lord. The Philistines didn't bring the ark of the Lord. God brought his own ark back, okay? Going back to verse 19, the men of Bethlehem looked into the ark of the Lord and God smote them. <laughs> now, that's a sad when unsaved people got more respect for God's stuff than saved people. Okay? The people of Beth Shemeth should have known better uh, not to look into that ark. But um, they, had, they didn't even have the, the respect or the common sense that the Philistines did. The Philistines didn't look in the ark. These guys looked in the ark, and they weren't supposed to. According to Numbers, the fourth chapter, you don't have to turn there. Numbers, the fourth chapter, the 18th verse only the priests and the holy consecrated people were to handle the ark and look into the ark. Yes, sir. And the Levite was there. Yes, sir. He, he came to... Yeah, the Levites were there because they're the ones that took it off the, off the yeah. cart. Yeah. So the priests stood there and did nothing. Yeah, you know. that's true. That's a very good point. The Levites were there. Now, I don't know exactly how this happened. I don't know if, if one man looked in the ark and it smoked 
50,000 around them, or if they had it set up a carnival style where people would just come by and look and, and walk by, but I, I'm not exactly sure how it happened, but it was, it was something that was displeasing to God because God had specifically told them back in Numbers, the fourth chapter, that if anyone who is not consecrated or set aside or holy, if you look in this art, you're going to die. All right, but they did it anyway, and so they didn't even have the the sense that the uh, that the Philistines had. Amen. Y'all see that? How are we looking on time? Five minutes. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, uh, how this can uh, uh, apply today is that uh, we, as as children of, of God, uh, there may be times where we don't have respect for God's word or respect for the things of God as much as sometimes the world does. That's not in all cases, but sometimes that happens. Yes, sir? Yes, sir. And, and, and let me give a, a New Testament proof to what you just said there. I want you to hold your place here, and we're going to turn to the New Testament for a moment. I want you to turn to the book of First Peter, the book of First Peter. So if you start in the back of the book, you're going to have Revelation, you're going to have Jude, then you have Third John, Second John, First John, then you have Second Peter, and then you have First Peter. If you wind up in James or Hebrews, you've gone too far to your left, okay? So, First Peter, let's look at the fourth verse, uh, fourth chapter, excuse me. First Peter, the fourth chapter. I'm looking for the verse now. Maybe it's, I'm not finding the verse that I'm looking for. Let me try Second Peter here just a moment. Excuse me. Yeah, Second Peter doesn't have fourth chapter. Um, where is that? Oh, here, us. Uh, 4.17, excuse me. 4.17. 1 Peter 4.17, are we there? Yes, sir. Okay. Look what it says here in 1 Peter 4.17, and then we're going to have to wrap up here in a moment. 1 Peter 4.17 says, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the gay bar. No. Huh? No. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the abortion clinic. No. Huh? No. no. That's not what it says? No, sir. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Amen. And if it first began at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Mm-hmm. If, if judgment begins with us, you know it's going to be bad for the people who are not following God. Amen. Okay. But God is going to start with us. Amen. All right. And and the rest of the world that they got stuff coming to them. Yes, sir. All right. They may look yes, all rich and glamorous and having a good time, but God's got their number too. Yeah. But he's going to start with us first because we should know better. These 50,000 or so men back in 1 Samuel 6, they knew better. Yeah. And so God punished them even though the Philistines were handling the cart like the ark like crazy. God winked at that. God says, "I I got I got them." But you should know better. Yes, sir. Old Testament or New Testament, if, if you believed on the Lord and you're saved, you're, 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 you're going to be with the Lord in, in heaven. All right. I believe that Eli, even though Eli was backslidden and God killed him in chapter four of first Samuel, I believe that Eli is in heaven. But God just took him out because he had no more use for him. Uh, Eli had proven to be not fruitful because he didn't restrain his sons who were not saved. Okay, and so sometimes God will get to the point where he will just take you out because you're, you're no good to him, even though you may be saved. So judgment must first begin at the house of God. Amen. I want you to look at something else here real quick. You're still in First Peter. I want you to turn to your left from First Peter. Uh, we're going to get into James and then Hebrews. All right. If you wind up in the T books, you've gone too far to your left. I want you to go to Hebrews 12, 8, Hebrews 12, 8, and then we'll call it done because I'm probably out of time. Uh, Hebrews 12, 5, excuse me. Are we there in Hebrews? Okay, look what it says here. Hebrews 12, 5. It says, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? But if ye be not, but if ye be without chastisement, whereof are ye partakers then? Ye are bastards and not sons. Uh-huh. Furthermore, we have 
had fathers of our flesh which corrected us and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much more, uh, shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward it yielded the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. What is all of this saying? That, that saying is that God's going to deal with you if you're a child of God. If you're a child of God, God's going to deal with you more severely than he is the people who are not saved. And he's chastening you. He's trying to draw you closer to him. He said if your physical, earthly, biological fathers used to whoop you behind, but they did it just for, for their profit so they wouldn't have to have you be disobedient and, and bother them. God is disciplining you so that you can draw you closer to him. He's doing it for your profit. He's doing it for your benefit. All right? Now, if you're not being chastened by the Lord, then you might need to check your salvation because God said he's going to chasten his sons. If you're not his sons, you're bastards or you're orphans. You're, you're not his. Okay? And so God is going to deal more severely with his own than he is with those of, 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 of the world. That's something that we need to keep in mind. All right? He is going to deal with the world, and the world will be judged. Don't get me wrong. But uh, in terms of this life, he's going to deal with, with us. Okay? According to what we just read in First Peter and Hebrews. All right? So... Um, I think we're out of. Oh yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. It's it's going to be a, a really rough time. Yeah. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. Even during the tribulation period, they're going to. The the scripture tells us that men will seek death and not be able to find it. How bad is that? Where you want to die and you can't die. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's pretty bad. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's right. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Amen. Um, any other questions or comments about 1 Samuel, the sixth chapter? No other questions, comments? Okay, well, we'll go ahead and, uh, and dismiss.